I got it. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. That's so Lisa. Do you need help? No, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> right, Lance? <laughs> I got it. It was so interesting traveling to Spain because I spent, um, I spent two years traveling back and forth to Wisconsin by myself. Just me because my husband would work, take care of the dog. I would go to Wisconsin, check on our son, and I'm so used to traveling by myself. So when somebody, like I know how to like push one big suitcase to the entrance, keep my eye on the suitcase, go back and get my other two and then push my other two. So in Spain, when they would ask me if I needed help, oh, no, I got it. And they're like, no, I've, I've got a free hand. So I want to tell you that Lance and Samuel made me cry in Spain because of their kindness to me. Because of their kindness to me. They would insist on help. No, I've, you know, I'm like, no, I got it. And they're like, no, I've got a free hand. They served me. And my, um, this is a, I've been praying this morning for wisdom because I have so many things I would like to share. But one of the fears that I have in my life that I work through, it's, it's a lie. It's that no one will help me. No one will help me. And I've struggled with that and struggled with that for years. So, Friday a week ago, I was in Aiken, South Carolina with my 38 and a half week pregnant daughter and my son-in-law, and I had taken him to Sam's. They wanted to buy a chest freezer. You know, it's, it's a big thing. So we, we had it in the cart. We got it out. We got it to the trunk. He set my, we set it in the trunk together, and my son-in-law was pushing the cart away, and there were these two men that, that showed up in the parking lot, big African-American men. When you need help, you want some big men. There were some big men, and they walked over, and the older man was like, do you need help? And I'm like, no, I've got it. I've got rope. I know how to tie my trunk down. I've done it before. I've got it. And the older man said to the younger man, Corey, tie that woman's trunk down for her. And I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> and he had been in the military. He knew how to make all the knots. He tied that thing perfectly. And a, a few days later, as I was just thinking through that lie that I've struggled with, no one will help me, I just broke down in tears that God would send two men that are strangers to me who just notice a little short woman and a, and a taller Hispanic man, um, my son-in-law, you know, with this big thing in the trunk and it's sticking out, and that God would send two men and just help me. And so God is teaching me over and over. I just broke down in tears how God teaches us those lies we believe. He sends people to say, no, I can hear Pastor Tom say it in, pastor, in prayer ministry. No, that's not true. The truth is that God is always with me. He will send help when I need it. And he does. That's why Lance and Samuel were the help. So it was so beautiful. That's just a wonderful story. Um, I do want to welcome everyone on the live stream. Um, I know some of my family members might be watching. And I wanted to let you know I'm sharing from the English Standard Version today. So can we um, put up the photo of Kayla, please? So it's not her real name, but we have um, Miss Jenny from the right. We have Miss Jenny. That's Amy. Of course, that's Miss Addie's head from behind laying hands on Kayla. And then there's me and Pastor Tom. And, and so Kayla was a young lady who, at the end of one of our services, she went up to the women's leader and she's like, I have to confess something. I have to confess something because Pastor Tom had talked about confession. And so I had been connecting with her during the trip. So I just went and grabbed her and, and Amy joined us and we sat down and she had just shared how... Um, she had had some issues with drugs. She had been in a rehab. And there was um, a pastor there, a leader in the rehab house, who had taken advantage of her vulnerability. And they had had a relationship, and he was, he was married. And she felt like it was her fault. That was the lie she was believing. She had been taken advantage of, but she felt like it was her fault. And this is the moment where Pastor Tom came and and I remember when I first came to this church, we had, I had been hurt by pastors. I had been hurt by pastors. Um, of course, I hadn't been perfect, but I had been hurt by pastors. And I remember we had Pastor Tom and Jenny over. This has been like 16 years. And I remember Pastor Tom sitting on my blue love seat saying, I'm sorry that a pastor hurt you. 
just taking responsibility at, for a group of people and saying, I'm sorry that those who should have not hurt you hurt you. So here he is to, to Kayla, not her real name, saying, I'm sorry that a pastor took advantage of you. And so this is what, they shared this a couple weeks ago when I wasn't feeling well. Um, this is my takeaway from Spain. This is worth, this is worth everything <laughs> that we went through. We went through a lot of spiritual battle before the trip. We, dead batteries, dead refrigerator, dead hot water heater, dead other thing. I mean, it was one spiritual battle after another, not to mention the, the emotional spiritual battle that I was going through just getting ready to go, and then getting sick and coming back and being sick for 10 days. But just this moment right here where this woman realized it, it was not my fault, just the lie that had paralyzed her and the shame and the guilt. And um, gosh, I want to I travel the world and do this. Give me 10 women a year. Give me 10 women a year. Give me one sidekick. Give me 10 women a year. I want to travel the world and do this. And I want to take, I'm sorry, I want to take teams of women to do this. I'm not going to say I'm sorry because I know my God will provide a way. I broke down in tears again on Friday over that, my God providing a way. I didn't touch a microphone the whole trip, but if I could do just this 15 minutes all over again, I would buy my ticket today. Just that. There are so many broken people in the world that are, are walking around believing lies and walking in shame. And just to see her set free, just to see her set free. She said she hadn't slept. She hadn't slept for two weeks. And she slept. She slept after that. Yeah, go ahead. Amen. So, speaking of worship, <laughs> so if, if you saw the beautiful worship today with all of our children, you know that freedom in worship, if you saw Sarah dance, hallelujah, <laughs> Sarah dance, freedom, of, freedom in worship is part of our DNA. It is GRC DNA. When we went to Costa Rica, our purpose was to take GRC DNA to Costa Rica, and we had a great breakthrough of freedom and worship in Costa Rica. So here we are going to Spain, and I'm still carrying that same GRC DNA to bring freedom and worship. And I, was it the first night when I asked you? The first night we're jet lagged, you know, oh my gosh, we were so jet lagged, so tired. The first night we're there to worship Wednesday night. And as usual, you know, I'm, I'm, sta I'm sitting there, I'm standing there and Holy Spirit's like, go up front. I'm like, hmm. I don't know these people. Nobody else is moving out of their seat. I don't know if that's accepted. I don't know if it's okay. I don't know if it's allowed. I don't know anything. And I look at Sarah. Will you go with me? And praise the Lord she did because I was too scared to go by myself. I was too scared to go by myself. But Holy Spirit said go. Praise the Lord. She went with me. And then um, a couple of days, I guess it was on Sunday. It was on Sunday when there were, what, 1,200 people there, lots of people there. And once again, the Holy Spirit is like, go. And I look at Sarah. I was like, this time I was nicer. I was like, will you go? But if you don't want to, it's okay. <laughs> and she said, I will in a little bit. So again, Holy Spirit said, go. And I went. And before you know it, I'm, you know, dancing, and I'm doing all of this, and, you know, hardly anybody else is moving, but, but there I am bringing GRC DNA, bringing freedom and worship. And not that it was just me. It, I was just obeying because there, there are times I will say I'm, I'm more afraid of disobedience to the Lord than what people think. I'm not there all the way. That's why I'm speaking carefully because Holy Spirit will say, oh, yeah. <laughs> is that true? He'll call me on it. But that is part of what we do. We bring that freedom and worship. But what I want you to know is I was scared. I was scared. I did it even though I was scared. And so 
um, the, the day before we left, I connected with one of the, the leaders in the house, actually where um, Kayla is, and we were just talking, and she said, you're just so bold. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking, well, 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 thank you. And so later as I started to process that, like, I didn't touch a microphone. What did she see? I was trying to figure out, okay, what was it that she saw that was bold? And the only thing I could come up with was I was up front twirling around at 53 years old with bad balance when nobody else was. When nobody else was. And eventually, praise the Lord, it, the worship broke out. And it was, oh my gosh, we were so sweaty and so tired and our calves hurt the next day. It was just so glorious. But what I don't see that Lisa's bold, I see all the lies and rejection and the fears that I have to push through and battle through to take that one bold step of faith. That's what I see. And so I want to talk today about what is boldness? What is it? Because I've spent a lot of time thinking, what, what did she see? What is it? Where does it come from? Because I don't see it. Lisa generally does not feel bold. <laughs> so I want to, I'm just going to ask a few questions. How many of you feel bold? Yes, and, so, and boldness can be generally, like a lot of times, and every now and then, momentarily. How many of you have ever been told that you were bold? Someone said, you are bold. So we have some bold people here today. And if you were told that you were bold, did it surprise you? No? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you feel bold. Some of us are like pushing through to take that step of faith, that bold action or the bold words. So um, if you guys will put up that first slide, the definition of boldness. So this is an English definition because she told me, I'm not looking at the biblical Greek and Hebrew words roots. This is what people see. This is how we communicate it's a willing, what people see, what boldness is, a willingness to take risks and act innovatively. Confidence or courage. A willingness to take risks. Okay, if you'll put up the next slide, please. We're going to define courage and confidence. Courage, the ability to do something that frightens you. Okay, so I know the Bible says, what, 365 times, do not fear. But there are times things are fearful. There are times God says, do this, and we know we're not supposed to be afraid, but there is the fear, and, and we have to battle through it. We have to push through it. Y'all, for years, I was afraid of walking down these steps. <laughs> and so in my sermons, I would write, okay, in this part, you're going to go down the steps. You're going to go down the steps. And then after years of walking down the steps, I'm not afraid of walking down the steps anymore. Might, I'm afraid I might fall sometimes, <laughs> but I'm not afraid of walking down the steps. Why? Because I did it afraid. I pushed through. I built the muscles that I don't, I learned, hey, nothing bad. Like, nobody slapped me. Nobody, you know. <laughs> really, I was afraid of getting, giving, getting away from my teaching notes. I was afraid I would get down here and not know what to say. I had to learn that if I stepped away, God was faithful God was faithful to show up and give me what to say. Like, I could probably go stand in the, oh, Lord, I don't want to say. If I say I can go do something, then Holy Spirit will say, oh, yeah. In an imaginary scenario, Lisa Mike could go back to the back of the church and preach for the next hour without her notes. I don't want to do that today. <laughs> but I've learned that God's faithful. That the Holy Spirit, and, and I learned it because so many of y'all, drew that out of me. Like these, my friends, the Hogans, I asked them to sit on the front row. I could not be this woman up here without all the encouragement they gave to me in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, sitting on the front row and smiling and nodding. I learned it was okay. I, I, I'm still learning. Courage, the ability to do something that frightens you. Confidence. The feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something, a firm trust. And that someone or something that we rely on is not ourselves. It's not our bank accounts. It's not our family or our friends. 
It's not our government. It's not our missiles. It's, it's God. And that's why I talk about a lot that I have a confident humility. I am confident that when I step out, God will be there. I have a humility that knows if I'm not relying on God, I am going to fail. So there is a confident humility that I've learned how to walk in. Like this morning, my face was on the carpet before the Lord. I know he's going to show up, but I'm like, I'm right here, and he's the Empire State Building that's knowing my position before him. The beloved daughter, but he is so much bigger than me. Confident humility. So, some people are generally bold. <laughs> like Big Brother Doug, I think, where is he? Is He's probably with the children. Big Brother Doug, he's bold. That man is bold. He was saying in the prayer room this morning, I'm not afraid of anything. He is not. He is not. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Some of us are still working to get there. Some of us are momentarily bold. Can a shy, quiet person be bold? Yeah, if we're going to look in Scripture. It, there's bold words and there's bold actions. So let's talk about where boldness comes from. Let's see. I'm going to look at this. So on your handout it says Acts 4.8, but I'm actually going to read it. Acts chapter 4. It's not there. Do, do, do. Acts 4. Okay. So, Peter, they had um, healed the man. Let's see. At the gate, beautiful. At the temple. They had healed a man, and now, now they're on trial because they healed this man. And for what they say they believe. We're going to start with, yeah, verse 7. So they said to Peter, and when they placed them in the center, they, well, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, catch that. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He's the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is salvation. He is preaching. He is preaching some serious truth, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Okay, now, look at verse 8, verse 13, excuse me. Now as they, as they observed the confidence, some versions might say boldness, of Peter and John, and they understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling. And began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So we see that they spoke boldly. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. So boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. And we can also add from spending time with Jesus. They could tell, like, can people look at you and say, oh, they've spent time with Jesus. Can they see that in your life? Can they see that? They've spent time with Jesus. So I want to talk about Holy Spirit. I don't know if you can choose favorites among the Trinity, but I've chosen one. Okay, this is not theologically sound. This is not the position of Global River Church. This is just Lisa. Okay, you're just, this is just Lisa, Lisa Morgan Moore. Like, Holy Spirit is my favorite. Holy, now, I love God the Father he knows that I love him. I love Jesus, my Savior, and my Lord. Holy Spirit is my friend, and Holy Spirit makes things fun. Holy Spirit definitely makes things fun. Holy Spirit is, is the joy. Holy Spirit transforms me from the sweet little church lady that people see out into the community into a bold preacher who casts out demons, who prays for healing, who lays hands on the sick and they recover, who is not afraid to fly, who goes to other countries by herself, 
and who does a lot of other things I'm not even going to tell you. Yeah. Holy Spirit may be this way. Like, my best friend calls me, this is Lisa 2.0. Like, if you knew me 16 years ago, that was Lisa 1.0. She was not like this. She was not like this at all. Like, she was still working through being perfected in love and overcoming fear. But when you're perfected in love and you push through those fears with courage and you learn God is faithful, then you can become a bold person. It's from the Holy Spirit. It's allow, it's making room for a Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in you. And it is terrifying at times. It is terrifying. I remember when I first asked um, God for the ability to preach. It was long before I had preached. It was probably, I think I preached first in 2019. Maybe, yeah, 2019. And I remember I was driving south on College Road, and actually I was thinking about my, Pastor Michael Thornton, and he has a gift of preaching. That man has a gift. Like, you, that man is, has a gift. And I was like, God, I'm just, I'm just driving. You know, God, I don't know if you want me to have this gift. But I want this gift. Give me this gift that I could be a bold preacher. Not like him, but like Lisa. And I remember just asking God, I want this gift. And it's Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit causes us to act boldly through spiritual gifts. And um, when, when we were talking, when we were in prayer this morning and talking about signs and wonders and revival, I kept thinking, it's all spiritual gifts. It's all from spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, Gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. If you have ever operated in any one of those spiritual gifts, it takes boldness. I know when people stand in front of Colosseums and say, I've got a word of knowledge for somebody born on November 11th, 1964, whose name is Scott. When they do that, that takes boldness. When you lay hands on someone and pray for healing, that takes boldness. Every spiritual gift requires boldness because it's, it's the Holy Spirit doing it in you. Whether it's speaking, whether it's praying, whether it's having faith for healing, whatever it is, those spiritual gifts require boldness. So I want to look at how boldness is related to your calling because it's, it's closely related. This is on your handout, Acts 13, 1 through 3. It says, now they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So these prophets and teachers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, recognized the gift of God in Barnabas. And let's see, is it Saul there? Yeah, Barnabas and Saul recognized the gift of God, laid hands on them, and sent them. Part of being, um, for me, part of being ordained was that others recognized the call of God on my life, that I was set apart for a special work, and hands were laid on me, and I was blessed and sent to minister. As we follow Paul and Barnabas, Acts 13, 46, they were in Pisidian Antioch. It says, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. Acts 14, 3, they were in Iconium. It says, they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You can follow Paul and the word boldness all through the Bible. You can find it again in Ephesus, Acts 19.8. In Rome, Acts 28. And as I was thinking through scriptures for this, um, this message, I kept remembering one that 
I had memorized years ago, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2. Paul writes, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So they were called to a certain, to a certain um, ministry to take the gospel to the Gentiles. They were called and they went forth boldly. So I believe you can look biblically and see where there is a calling, a setting apart. There is a boldness that comes with it. They're, 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 they're partners. They go hand in hand. So there are things for you, things that God has called you to. Big things, small things. Maybe opening a business. It may be starting a ministry. It may be praying for the sick, sharing the gospel. All kinds of things God has called you to. And in these areas where you, have a, where you carry a special anointing, like you may have an anointing to pray for healing and see people healed. In these areas where God has called you, equipped you, anointed you, there is a boldness that comes with it. He has given you a boldness for those areas. It could be missions, politics, business. It could be a temporary boldness. It could be a boldness that you're just generally bold. So this is on your handout. This is what I've learned. When you know that you are called to do something, there is a driving passion that makes you willing to take risks, and others think you are crazy or reckless. Okay? Did God really say? <laughs> Did God really say? In 20, January, January 2023, I went to Costa Rica by myself for language school. I had some concerned people that said, I don't think that's safe. <laughs> I wasn't going to call you out. I had somebody say, I'm going to talk to your husband about that. That didn't go over really well with me. My husband was in agreement that I could go because I'm called to minister in Spanish. And when you are called to do something, you listen to podcasts every night falling asleep in Spanish. You listen to books in Spanish. You watch movies in Spanish. You talk to every Hispanic person in Lowe's and Walmart. Like you stalk the Spanish people so you can practice. And the one thing I really needed Pastor Tom to allow me to do in Spain, I was like, can I please just walk from the church to the hotel by myself? I just need that bit of freedom. And once he said that, I was like, I'm seeing y'all English speakers later. I went all through the church, through the building. I spoke with Pastor Alberto and with Louise, every person that would speak Spanish to me. I went and spoke to them. Because I am called to this, called to it. Now, there's not a lot of air conditioning in Hispanic countries. I don't really like that part. But um, I'm looking at dates to go back to Costa Rica for Spanish school in July. Now, I want to use wisdom. I'm going to take my taser. I'm going to take some mace because I've learned that Uber drivers, some of them are kind of shady in Costa Rica. I learned that. But it's, a, it's because I'm called to it. I'm willing to be bold. Because, I, I mean, clearly, do you all agree I'm called to speak Spanish? Si. Eres llamada a hablar en español y compartir el evangelio en todo el mundo. You're called to speak Spanish and share the gospel in all the world. So I want to put this into context because people, especially in missions, put their lives at risk. If you'll put up the picture of Becky Graves. Becky Graves is a friend of mine. I've known her. Our kids were in first grade together. So I've known her a long time. And she has a ministry called Haiti Awake. I think I put that on your handout. It's um, HaitiAwake.org. And she, um, she's been going to Haiti for years and years and years. She founded this ministry. She has a staff of people in Haiti that are caring for children, ministering to the community, going into prisons, taking food. And she was in Haiti um, as late as, I think it was early March when things started truly, truly falling apart. She was on the last commercial flight out of Haiti. The last. The last. Now, she has a lot of wisdom. She participates in a group that does risk management. She's, she's got a lot of wisdom. And Holy Spirit told her, 
you need to leave. But she has risked her life, a white woman in Haiti, with all the unrest, where, where gunfire, the sound of gunfire is normal there. It's just in the background. She's in Port-au-Prince. It's normal. It's not safe. Shouldn't somebody talk to her husband? <laughs> but when God has called you to do something, and when your husband and your family know that God has called you to do it, this is a quote. She, um, some of us, Jan Ricky and Carrie, uh, hopefully Carrie um, Henderson and I are going to Honduras in August with the Bridge Church. And she's part of the bridge, so she did a training. And I wasn't there in person, but I, I watched it last week. And she shared this verse, Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And I tell you what, for me, overcoming the fear of flying was overcoming the fear of death. It really was. I was afraid to die in a plane crash underwater, feeling trapped and out of control. But now, y'all, if, 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 if God chooses to take me home on a plane, I am happy to meet Jesus. Don't mourn for me. I am happy to meet Jesus. So when we overcome that fear of death, when we overcome fear of failure, I'm preaching to myself, fear of rejection, then we can step out and do things boldly. It's overcoming fear. So Becky said in this training, she says, my purpose is not to preserve my life. Now, we live in America. We're trying to preserve our life. My perp we're trying to even preserve our comfort. My purpose is not to preserve my life, but to give glory to the one who gave me life. That's my purpose. That's my purpose. It's not, we live in this false sense of, of, of security. I mean, it's more dangerous to drive to Walmart than it is to fly. So we want to be willing, we want wisdom and discernment and good counsel. We don't want to be stupid, but we want to overcome fear and be bold and step out in faith. The Apostle Paul, he did not seek to preserve his life. In 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28, he lists all these things that he went through. He received lashes. He was beaten. He was stoned, shipwrecked, in danger from rivers, from robbers, from people, danger from Gentiles in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, from false brothers, toil, hardship, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, without food, in cold and exposure. That man did not seek to preserve his life. He did some things that we would call crazy or reckless, and we would say, is that God? Are you sure that's God saying that? Because that doesn't seem safe to me. That doesn't seem wise to me. But he had been called. He knew he was called. He didn't let the naysayers say, I don't think that's God. That's not wise. We even see in um, Acts 21, this is when the prophet um, at Acts 21, 13, the prophet Agabus had prophesied that he was going to be bound. He was going to be bound and delivered to the Gentiles. They urged him, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go. Truly, that's not God. Don't go. They're trying to talk him out of his calling. And this is what he says, Acts 21, 13. What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm not, I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. There's a book that Becky recommended. It's about one hour on Audible. I listened to it Friday. And it's, it's written on your handout. It's called Risk is Right. Better to lose your life than to waste it. And he, he talks about Paul and all the things Paul went through. And he just says Paul's whole life was one stressful risk, risk after another. Every step, there was another danger. Every step, there was another place where it was uncomfortable. There was another place where he was out of his zona de comfort, his comfort zone. And that's where, that's where God shines. That is where God shines. 
When I was in Spain trying to translate people from Portugal, trying to speak bad Spanish into English, woo, it had to be Holy Spirit. If I was able to translate anything at all, it had to be Holy Spirit. And I could feel the words coming. I could feel the words coming. It was Holy Spirit because I'm just crazy enough to believe that I can go to another country and be an interpreter. I am crazy enough to believe that Holy Spirit will show up. I worked through some fear with that. And I took 30 hours of lessons in March. 30 hours of Spanish lessons. Getting ready. <laughs> so I, I use some wisdom, but I'm willing to step out by the grace of God. By the grace of God. I, I won't say I have done everything he's ever told me to do because that would be a lie. Lots of times when I've been too afraid to do it. A few times where I've been, if, been willing to step out in faith and allow God to shine and allowed him to receive the glory. He receives the glory. Me overcoming a fear of flying that I had since 1996, no, 1994. Brian remembers when it came. There was a plane that crashed in Charlotte, my hometown, on a city street. Like if a plane crashed right out here, some of us might be traumatized. Right? It might be traumatic might cause us not to ever want to do that because it's not safe. But God enabled me to overcome a fear of flying. He just gets all the glory. He gets all the glory. He gets all the glory because it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't make us slaves to fear. Jesus did not make us slaves to fear. There is an ability to step through that fear, to push through, to obey, and for you to be bold. And let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you one thing. Shame will keep you in your seat. Shame will keep you in your seat. Let me tell you what I laid down this morning. Let me tell you what I put in that trash can. Shame. Shame is what I put in that can. Because I've believed this lie that I cannot be a good missionary because I'm prissy, okay? <laughs> because I'm prissy. My whole life, and I had to do some deep work with the Holy Spirit because this all came forth going to Spain. Like I'd messaged the group, I'd hurt my back. I'd hurt my back, and it was hard for me to even lift my carry-on. And I just messaged the group, hey, I might need some help putting my carry-on in the overhead because, y'all, if you're sitting next to a, if you're sitting right here and a four-foot-ten woman is trying to do this, it, you're scared. Because it's hard for me on a normal day to put my bag up in the carry-on compartments. But what the devil was saying is, you think you're a princess. They're going to think you're just a princess. They're going to they're gonna think that, that you think you're better than them. And that's the lie. From childhood, people have said, you think you're better. For whatever reason, you're stuck up. You think you're this. You think you're that. You th and I didn't even know this was part of me until working through it with the Lord with Living Fearless, a book uh, Loretta recommended to me. I did not even know all that shame that's followed me my whole life that says you think you're better. Like, y'all, I can barely make it through a lot of days. I don't think I'm better. And, our, and Pat was like, you know, wouldn't they want to honor a pastor and help her put her bag over her head? And that's why it made me weep that, that Samuel and Lance would serve me because the devil kept saying, you just, you're just a princess. You can't do it. You can't be a missionary. You're, you can't do this. You can't do that. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, can you find my phone in my purse? Look at me. I'm being so bold. I'm going to take you all past 12 o'clock. Good gracious. <laughs> so as Pastor Tom um, shared that last day in, um, in Madrid, he was talking about the lies that we believe and working through those lies. And this is what I wrote. <laughs> God has called me to be a missionary. Like while he was preaching, this is what I wrote. Therefore, he has equipped ooh, don't fall, me to be a missionary. I am just as equipped as other missionaries. The call qualifies me. Others recognize this call and support me and desire me. Like they want me to come. People want me. 
with my hot pink glitter nail polish and my new shiny preaching earrings. They want me to come, okay? I am not disqualified by my personality, my appearance, my height, my sweetness, or my too muchness. It does not disqualify me. The call qualifies the called, not the expectations of what a missionary should be like. Okay? And then this is what the Lord said. This was the Lord. I will surprise the world by the vessel that is carrying the scent of my spirit. Like when you've got a woman with hot pink nail polish, you don't expect she's going to be casting out any demons. She just looks all frou-frou. Yeah, I'm frou-frou. But God has called me to be a missionary. He's equipped me and trained me and given me the skills. I'm ordained. I'm a le- I've finally made peace. I'm a leader. I can say that. I'm a leader. I'm a leader. So there are these lies that we believe that, that keep us from walking in what God has called us to do. I have totally left my message. Praise the Lord. Some good stretching. I love it. So, yeah. So just very quickly, some bold actions. We're not going to turn there, but it's there, the references are in your outline. Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea. It says he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Nobody probably even knew he was doing that. Boldness. Um, the widow's might in Luke 21, 1 through 4, Jesus says, This poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Boldness in giving. It's a bold action. The woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus. He felt power. She came trembling and falling down before him. She was scared. But she was bold. She took a bold action. Probably my favorite, Hebrews 4, 16. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is a bold action to come before God. And especially when you've blown it, especially when you've sinned, when you've fallen, when you know you haven't obeyed the Lord, but it says to come boldly to the throne of not condemnation, but grace. What are you going to find there? Mercy, grace to help when in your time of need. So we can come boldly. Those are bold actions. So I want to wrap up by just giving you some action steps. How can you develop boldness in your life? Of scripture that I found, Psalm 138, verse 3, and this is from the New American Standard. It says, on the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. It's God that makes you bold. You can't make yourself bold. But I think we should always be growing. Like my growth, my growth thing this year is I want to take three mission trips and maybe preach every two weeks sometimes. Like, I, that's, I want to continue to push myself. Even today, Lance knows I learned how to actually unmute myself and not depend on the sound team to do it for me. Like, I want to continue to grow. So how can you develop boldness? The first thing is just keep walking with God. If you're newly saved, it's okay if you're not bold yet. But as you walk with God, you develop a history with him. And as you step out in faith, you learn he's faithful. And then you learn, okay, I can step out in faith again. And then there comes a point where that thing that used to scare you doesn't scare you anymore. Because you've learned God's faithful. He's faithful. If you step out, he's going to show up and be there. He told me one time, I won't leave you standing at the altar. I'm not going to leave you standing at the altar. If you step out, he'll show up. So just keep walking with God. Just keep walking. Just keep learning and growing. Take baby steps of faith and see his faithfulness. The second one is to connect with bold people. Watch them. Learn from them. My friend Pat Bradford, she is a bold person. And I watch her at these school board meetings and the things she does, and I'm like, wow. 
because this sweet little church lady is very glad <laughs> she's not having to do what Pat, out of obedience to the Lord, is doing and where she's walking. But as you observe the lives of bold people, you learn from them. So hang out with bold people, people that are going to push you to grow, people that are going to push you, what's the next step? What's, I've, a lot of times I'll ask Pastor Tom, what's the next step in my leadership development plan? Which, that's a good question. I need to ask you that. Um, you know, what's the next thing to do? He's the reason I'm doing prayer ministry. That was not my idea. He's the reason I'm ordained. That was not my idea. It was his. So hang out with bold people. Ask people, how can I grow? How can I continue to grow? Growing is good. Watch, observe, learn. The next thing is just to deal with fear. Deal with fear and rejection. Fear, rejection, and shame will keep you chained, and you'll just be chained to your chair. I know. I've been there. I'm still pushing through some areas. I'm still dealing with fear of rejection. I'm still working with the Lord to become completely free, to get rid of shame, and just to be the Lisa God made me to be, just to be comfortable in my own skin with my flashy jewelry and my, my glitter nail polish. I'm going to have a grandbaby any day, and it's a little girl, and I wanted my nails to look good for those little baby pictures. <laughs> Had to be hot pink. Had to be hot pink, y'all. But... Come to prayer ministry if you need to. Let's, let's help you work through fear of rejection, fear of man, fear of failure, fear of death. As you deal with those fears and as you, like, rebuke, the, as you renounce the lies. Like, I didn't even know I was believing the lie that Lisa's just stuck up and thinks she's better than everybody else. It was a lie I've been believing for 40 years since people started saying it when I was about 12, 40 years. And that kept me, you know, afraid and beat up and held back. That's why I cried in Costa Rica when Pastor, Pastor Willie said I was a princess. He was joking, but I'd been carrying that thing for 40 years. It was a tender spot. It was a trigger. God's healing me of it. And the final step, I think it's the final step, yeah, yeah, well, that's part of it. Renounce the lies that you've believed and declare the truth of God. Like me, believe in the lie that I'm a bad missionary. That's not true. People want me to come. I want to go. I'm desirable <laughs> in my package, even though it is very hard for me when it's hot. Y'all, it's hot. <laughs> when you're in midlife and there's heat, it's hard. I'm telling you what, it's hard. The other, um, I'm... I'm going to close in just a second. But the other thing that I really struggled with in Spain was because my back hurt, I couldn't weigh my suitcase. And Brian was at work. And I knew it felt heavy. And I'd put my heating pad and all my things. And I'd put my laptop in there, too. I forgot about that. And so it was overweight. And the, the desk attendant at the airport shamed me for it. So then every time somebody mentioned my luggage, it was just like, you're just a princess. You have to take all your clothes and all your jewelry and all your shoes. And, y'all, I just didn't want to be hot or cold. I had everything from flip-flops to a puffer jacket. I had my scarf and I had my shorts. So whether it was hot or, like, I have a fear of being uncomfortable. That's what the Lord showed me. I have a fear of being uncomfortable. I have a fear of being hot and a fear of being cold. So I had it all. But thank God, going back, I gave things away. <laughs> I gave things away. <laughs> Dump things out. Pastor Tom carried some stuff. I was, I was underweight going back because I'm a good missionary. Even if my bag is over 50 pounds, I paid it. I paid the cost. So what I want to do as we close is um, I'm going to do something very different. People, that, Pat and Pastor Bishop are going to be really proud of me. I want to do an altar call. So if y'all can put on some music, please. And if I can have y'all stand up, please. This is new for me. I'm growing. Being obedient to what Holy Spirit showed me. And if I can have the ministry team, the ministry team come, please. So what, what I want to do to close is have a time of impartation. There are some of you that God has been speaking something he wants you to do, and you're struggling to have the courage to take that step of faith, to be bold, to trust him, to step forward in confidence. And what we want to do as a team is to pray for you 
and to impart that courage to you. The courage is the ability to do it even if you're afraid. It's the ability to step forth. And so we want to pray for you and impart that courage to you. So I'm going to close this in prayer. And then if you want to come forward and receive an impartation of courage, of boldness, of faith, please do. And if not, I'll bless you to go and enjoy your days. Father God, I just thank you that you are so faithful and you are so good and you're so amazing. I just honor who you are today. You are a good father. And when we step out in faith, in obedience, following you, you never let us down. You never let us down. You never fail us. God, I thank you that you didn't give us our lives to preserve them, to be secure and comfortable. God, but you gave us our lives to give you glory. So God, let us give you glory by how we lay down our lives. Jesus, you said if we want to follow you, we need to take up our cross and follow you. Whoever desires to, sa- to, preserve his, to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus, we want to follow you. So help us to overcome fear. Help us to identify the lies. Help us to know the truth of what you say about us. And help us to take bold steps of faith to continue to build your kingdom around the world. I bless these that have come in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please come forward for prayer. Thank you.